Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is Man Behind the Curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. So today we have science and health journalist Gary Tobbs joining us to talk about his new book, The Case for Keto, Rethinking Weight Control and the Science and Practice of Low-Carb, High-Fat Eating. This is Gary's second appearance on STEM Talk. We had a lot of ground to cover since his last appearance was way back in 2016. And so we have divided his interview into two parts. In today's interview, we will talk to Gary about his new book and his reasons for writing it. So our interview with Gary in 2016 followed the release of his book, The Case Against Sugar, a book that went on to become a New York Times bestseller. And The Case for Keto is Gary's fourth book he has written about diet and chronic disease. His two most recent books, as well as his two earlier books, Good Calories, Bad Calories, and Why We Get Fat, followed a 2002 New York Times article that suggested the low-fat orthodoxy that held sway in America since the 1970s might be wrong. So when Good Calories, Bad Calories came out, Michael Pollan, the author of The Omnivore's Dilemma, wrote that Gary's book was vitally important and also destined to change the way that we think about eating. With the case for keto, Gary is once again encouraging people to rethink about the way they eat. In part two of our interview with Gary, we will dig deeper into his efforts to set the record straight about the role of diet and weight control in preventing chronic disease, as well as the role that diet plays in helping people improve their health spans and lifespans. Gary turned to journalism back in the 1970s after receiving his master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Stanford University. Today, he continues to practice journalism and is the founder and board chairman of the Nutrition Science Initiative. But before Ken and I get to our interview with Gary, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker STEMFAN53. The review is titled, Exceptional, Unique, and Eclectic. The review reads, As a non-scientist, I relish both the content and form and how topics are presented. Both Ken and Don are super prepared, curious, and knowledgeable in interweaving the science and biographical aspects of their guests. Truly a favorite. Well, thank you so much, STEMFAN53, and thank you to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who've helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to our interview with Gary Tobbs. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining us today is Gary Tobbs. Gary, welcome to STEM Talk. Uh, thank you for having me. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Gary. So, Gary, welcome back to the show, first of all. So we have to ask you, how's life in California? Uh, we're just going to guess that being in lockdown because of COVID isn't such a bad thing for a writer. Uh, no, I have a friend who said she's been in lockdown since 1984. So. Um, it <laughs> has not changed. Uh, yeah, I feel the same. Hasn't changed my life all that much, except reading the daily papers and keeping up with the news on the internet is uh, dismaying, as it is for everyone. It's a full time job, anyway. <laughs> uh, indeed, hard to focus on other work <laughs> when the world seems to be going to hell in a hay basket. So, the case for keto is your fourth book that has followed and expanded on your 2002 article in the New York Times Magazine, which was entitled "What if it's all been a big fat lie?" So, I'm wondering, did you foresee that you would end up writing four books about the relationship between diet and chronic disease when the article first came out 20 years ago? Uh, short answer: absolutely not. <laughs> um, 
I did write that article in part. There was a book I very much wanted to write about the problems with the science of nutrition. I realized that from the two articles that preceded that New York Times Magazine piece. I had two investigative pieces that together took me almost two years for the journal Science. And I knew that the nutrition and obesity research was what uh, my physicist friends would have called uh, rife with pathological science. But I couldn't afford to do that book because I also knew it would take up a few years of my life and um, I couldn't get a large enough advance. When I got that infamous New York Times Magazine cover story, the advance problem was solved. I got enough money to pay for four years of my life, and then I spent five years writing the book. <laughs> so, Turned out in doing that research that there was a world of implications and good and bad science to unpack in the nutrition, obesity, chronic disease field. So the further in I dug, the more you know, I could have written the first draft of Good Calories, Bad Calories was 400,000 words unfinished. And uh, eventually we published around 180,000. Mm -hmm. So I knew that there was a lot to, to unpack there. It just has taken me 20 years to do it. And I still have two more books I want to write. Mm -hmm. In that New York Times article, you questioned the effectiveness of low-fat diets, which the government's dietary guidelines have been consistently recommending since the late 1970s. You highlighted research in your article that indicated a low-carb approach was indeed an effective way for many people to lose weight and generally improve their health. Almost overnight, you became one of the nation's number one public health enemies in some circles, at least in the minds of you know many nutritionists and a good chunk of the medical establishment. But you must have sort of expected that kind of pushback when you wrote the article because you were going against sort of the approved uh, narrative. Did you expect it or was it a surprise to you? Uh, I knew it was going to be the most controversial article the New York Times Magazine had run since they ran a piece by a friend of mine on the inutility of recycling. <laughs> I didn't expect the fierceness of the response that was a little bit like being kicked in the head. Um, in retrospect, I, I completely understand it. But uh, when I originally, the original article for the Times Magazine, uh, I led with Dr. David Ludwig, who was this young obesity uh, pediatric endocrinologist at uh, Boston's Children's Hospital. He was associated with Harvard. He was treating uh, children with obesity with uh, what he called carbohydrate-modified diets and, uh, you know, low-carbohydrate diets rather than low-fat diets. And I saw him as a politically correct sort of a way to get into this article where it wouldn't defend anyone. And they would say, oh, well, if a, a young idealistic Harvard professor is doing this and it's something we should take seriously. And then down below in the article, I, I discussed the influence of Atkins. Dr. Robert Atkins, who became famous and wealthy for pushing a you know ketogenic diet. And then after I handed it in, the editor said, well, we love it, but put Atkins in the lead. And uh, I remember I wrote a lead in which I said if the medical um, community had a, a waking up in Times Square naked kind of nightmare scenario it would be that their dietary advice to eat less fat was wrong and doing more harm than good and that Dr. Robert Atkins and his crazy ketogenic diet was maybe right or maybe both. And I read this to my wife and I said, I love this and they'll never run a word of it. That hasn't got a prayer in hell. And then I sent it into the editors and they ran it exactly as I wrote it. And then they put a porterhouse steak on the cover, this, this, the greasiest photo of a steak they could, they could get photographed with a pat of butter on, and they even told me later they picked the greasiest one they could find to, you know, up the, the tension between what we were saying and what the conventional uh, wisdom was. I remember that steak. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, most many people do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, this should be good you know, <laughs> when I saw the cover because I, I had read your pieces in science and uh, I recognized your name from, uh, I think you were on the staff there. You had written some stuff about physics too, I think. But anyway, I remember I recognized your name and I saw the steak and I thought, oh, this will be good. <laughs> yeah. And this is, you can't challenge, you can't expect as a journalist to challenge, in this case, in effect, well, in, in that article, it was 60 years of thinking. Now I'm, I'm 
backed it up to a 90 or 100 years of conventional wisdom and you know make the argument that the the research uh, clinical research establishment the, the investigators working on this the public health authorities promoting it the dietitians who have learned this in in school and are promoting it to their patients and all these people are just wrong without expecting people in effectively all of them to disagree with you. And if it was a small publication I was writing for, then, then, then they could just ignore me. But putting it on the cover of the New York Times magazine made it impossible to ignore. Mm -hmm. I've learned to largely ignore the New York Times, so I would have been immune to uh, that response. <laughs> Um, I'm leaning in that direction. <laughs> Smart <finger>. certainly in, <laughs> in Certainly in the fields I know well. And this is always a problem. You assume that in the fields you don't, they're getting it right. But if, if we can't trust the paper of record, who can we trust? And this is another three-hour conversation we probably shouldn't have. It is. So, Gary, in Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, he has a few lines in his introduction about how Dr. Robert Atkins brought Americans the very welcome news that they could eat more meat and lose weight just so long as they laid off the bread and pasta. And Michael even mentioned your 2002 New York Times article and how you wrote about new studies suggesting that the low-fat orthodoxy of the 1970s might be wrong. And it was not fat that made us fat, but rather the carbohydrates that we eat. And he then wrote about how bread and pasta started disappearing almost overnight from supermarket shelves and restaurant menus as a result of your article. So do you remember that period? And we're curious, were you surprised by how the Atkins and other low-carb approaches, like the South Beach diet, for example, suddenly became so popular? Well, they had always been popular. That's one of the interesting things. But they had always been something you never talked about. I mean, Atkins' book, uh, Atkins' Diet Revolution, was uh, at one point was the best-selling book in history. <laughs> um, but then it was considered quackery. One of the, the things that, I mean, the, the tipping point in that article of mine, and this is what's interesting, using that phrase tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell in The New Yorker three years earlier had done a piece on obesity. The Pima Paradox, it was called, a beautifully written piece, as Malcolm's always are, and in it he, in effect, made fun of diet books and fad diets and Atkins in particular. And when I came along in 2001, we basically had the same assignment, which was to understand the obesity epidemic. And Malcolm had sided with the conventional wisdom. By the time I came along in 2001, I had investigators like David Ludwig at Harvard and Eric Westman at Duke who were taking these diets seriously. And then I came upon, and I could I could shadow them and their practices. I spent time with David up at Harvard, and I spent time with Eric Westman down at Duke. But then there had been five clinical trials that had been completed, but never, not yet published. They had been discussed in conferences so I could discuss them. And, and they're really interesting what they did. You randomize you know, or be subjects which were anything from adults weighing 280 pounds in one trial to adolescents in another, but you randomize them to either the conventional diet approach, which at the time was a low-fat, calorie-restricted diet of the kind that the American Heart Association was promoting for virtually everyone in America, or Atkins diet, which is what we call keto today. And Atkins is high-fat, high-saturated fat, eat as much as you like. So the idea, the conventional wisdom is that fat people get fat because they eat as much as they like. So by that thinking the Atkins diet should cause more weight gain. And the conventional wisdom is that dietary fat, saturated fat causes heart disease. So by that thinking, the Atkins diet should, you know, up heart disease risk factors. And that's why Atkins was always considered a quack. And in all five of these trials, the subjects randomized to the Atkins diet not only lost more weight, despite getting to eat as much as they wanted, they had better heart disease risk factors despite eating a high-fat, high-saturated-fat diet. Because I had come from a hard science background, my take was, look, my hypothesis was that high-fat and saturated fat causes heart disease, but this is trials do not confirm that hypothesis. And our everyone's hypothesis is if you get to eat as much as you want, you'll just get fatter, and these trials don't confirm that hypothesis. So maybe those hypotheses are wrong. And that's never how the medical community has embraced it, but that's how I, that's how I came away, and that was the germ of skepticism that infected everything else I did. Mm-hmm. 
on the jacket of your book, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which was your first book to follow the 2002 New York Times article, there's a blurb from Michael Pollan we mentioned earlier that reads, this is a vitally important book destined to change the way we think about eating. Good calories, bad calories, however, didn't change the nation's dietary guidelines <laughs> or the American Heart Association's low-fat diet recommendations. Or how Michael Pollan thought. <laughs> yeah, well, that would even be harder. But here we are 20 years later, and the ketogenic diet is really very popular. It's one of Google's most popular search terms every month. So what's driving this interest in the diet? It's certainly not driven by the official story or by the U.S. dietary guidelines or general medical advice. We'll come back to the guidelines later, but how do you see this diet maintaining its popularity? What, what's driving it? Now, at one point, I wanted to call the case for keto, I wanted to call it in defense of fat diets. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's relatively simple. We have obesity and diabetes uh, epidemics, uh, confusing word to use nowadays, but the explosions in the prevalence of obesity and diabetes that begin around the 1960s to the point that three in four Americans are overweight or obese and uh, one in 10 have diabetes. Uh, these are stunning numbers. And uh, you can argue that for effectively all of these people, the conventional wisdom failed them. So at one time or another in their life, they struggled mightily to control their weight, and they probably still struggle mightily to control their weight, and they don't succeed. And controlling their weight means trying to eat less and exercise more and eat mostly plants and eat low-fat diets and healthy diets. And, you know, they, however you want to define it, those are things these people are all going to try. They're things we all have all tried. If you are functionally intelligent in the 21st century and you're overweight and obese, you have tried eating less and exercising more. You've tried low-fat diets. You've probably tried mostly plants. You may have gone vegetarian or vegan, at some point you are going to get to ketogenic diets, keto, because they're the, the most popular fad diets out there. And so if they work for you, and by work we mean allow you to achieve and maintain a healthy weight without hunger, then you're likely to stick with it. And what I did and uh, colleagues, people like Nina Teicholz and, and, and many others, is we managed to communicate the idea that these diets are not deadly, that the clinical trials tell us they're benign. So this way of eating can be tried. And, and to me, that's, it's, it's a direct result of the obesity and diabetes epidemics. The more people get heavier, the more people are going to try keto. <laughs> and if it works, the more people are going to try and sustain it. And now you have a world of products out there that mm -hmm. make it easier. And people have friends that suddenly look different and they say, what happened to you? Yeah. And th they tell them. Yeah, and that's the, um, one of the points I made in my new book is, um, I estimate, well, when I first started this 20-odd years ago, I could find maybe, a, maybe there were a half dozen or a dozen physicians in the country who were prescribing these diets to their patients and eating them themselves and believed that this was a healthy thing to do. And half of those had written diet books, you know, Atkins, Mike and Mary, Dan Eads, the Sugar Busters guys. In 2011, when I published Why We Get Fat, and I had a chapter at the back of the book giving advice on how to do the diet and how to think about it, kind of a chapter that I, the, the case for keto is a massive expansion of, I found a half dozen doctors I could interview who had uh, clinical experience with these diets, so I could use them to discuss the challenges and how best to eat this way. For the case for keto, I estimate there's now a few tens of thousands of physicians out there, all of whom have gone through what Gladwell has called a conversion experience, which means they were getting heavier, they were getting obese or diabetic, or tried all the conventional approaches, exercise. Some of them were world-class athletes who found themselves with either pre-diabetes or diabetes or obesity, and then they eventually tried low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets. And it worked. And now they prescribe it to their patients and they see it work with their patients. So they're frustrated. They're delighted that they can make their patients healthier, which is why they went into medicine. They're frustrated with the push by the continued embracing by the authorities of this idea that these diets are dangerous and mm -hmm. people shouldn't, can't eat this way, let alone shouldn't. 
And Gary, on that note, so your 2011 bestseller, which you've been talking about why we get fat, condensed the massive research you did for good calories, bad calories, and also provided new arguments and research for the hormonal cause of obesity, in which the consumption of sugar and carbohydrates drives insulin resistance, which in turn drives obesity and diabetes. And at the heart of both of these books is your argument that there has been misinterpretation of nutritional scientific data, which has ultimately been used to develop a U.S. food policy that recommends a low-fat diet, as we've been talking about. Since these two books came out, there has been a steady accumulation of studies supporting carbohydrate restriction and the safety of saturated fats. So I'm guessing that has to be pretty rewarding for you. It's rewarding on one level. You know, again, when I first started this 20 years ago, so a healthy diet 20 years ago is defined as a diet that was low in salt and low in saturated fat and maybe low in fat and maybe high in mostly plants. That, that would have been the conventional thinking 20 years ago. Today, if you were to ask nutritionists to define a healthy diet, the first thing they would say is it's low in ultra-processed foods, by which they mean sugar and highly refined grains. The, the not-for-profit I co-founded, uh, Nusi, funded a study at Stanford that was going to compare a low-fat diet to a low-carb diet. And, and the principal investigator, Christopher Gardner, insisted that he, he both diet approaches restrict sugars and refined grains because he thought it was unethical if he allowed one of the diet groups to eat those, even though they're... So you have a low-fat group restricting sugar and refined grains, which are carbs, and it's called low-fat, but it's carbohydrate restricted. So this has become conventional thinking. Um, I don't think anyone in the public health arena says, thanks, Gary Taubes, we really appreciate all you've done, getting us to pay more attention to that. But nonetheless, it has shifted. The problem is all the baggage from the low-fat era has stuck with us as well. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, we still have the USDA. While they don't talk about their dietary approaches as low fat and the idea is you're supposed to still restrict saturated fat but replace it with polyunsaturated fats. The dietary approaches that they promote are still de facto low fat, high carb diets. And while they don't, they now restrict uh, what they consider a healthy level of sugar consumption. They don't suggest people abstain from sugar consumption uh, entirely, which is something I might add. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Well, uh, following on that theme, your, your new book, The Case for Keto, it really seems to be an attempt to clarify the, all the misunderstandings that people have, not only about low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet, but to set the record straight about decades of misunderstandings that we've had as a society about diet, weight control, and overall health. Not surprisingly for you, but that is quite an ambitious undertaking. You know, what motivated you for this particular book? It sort of makes sense in a way if you look at your string of publications on this topic, but was there a particular itch that you were trying to scratch with this book? Uh, well, the book actually started out with the idea that I should just write my food rules. You know, we've talked about Michael Pollan a bit. Michael had Omnivore's Dilemma and then In Defense of Food. And then he published a book called Food Rules, which was just these, you know, took him, I've been told it took him three weeks to write, uh, where it was, you know, all the clever little things mm -hmm. that people had written to him about how you should eat, you know. Yeah, like eat less, mostly vegetables. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I was uh, going to do something like that, and then I decided I didn't want to do that. It just didn't interest me. Um, and rather, I wanted to, in effect, learn where we were in 2017 when I started the reporting this, because I knew, like I said, that, that, that thousands of physicians were taking this up and prescribing it to their patients. And clearly, I, and I also had now a decade since my first book to come out to be criticized by people. So what I wanted to do was address a lot of those criticisms because that's how the conventional thinking went. And much of it still came down to this embracing of the idea that a calorie is a calorie and we get fat because we eat too much. And to me, that's the most destructive 
paradigm obesity researchers could have come up with. And I think the people who promote it, which is still 99% of the research establishment, the clinicians, just don't think it through. They never have the opportunity to really think what this means and what this implies. So I wanted to go through and discuss all the things it implies, this idea that obesity is caused by eating too much, which seems intuitively obvious until you think about it, rather than the idea that obesity is a sort of hormonal dysregulation of the physiological mechanisms that control fat accumulation. I was reading a book recently, a wonderful book written by a young woman who struggles with severe obesity, and it's called What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. And she says she tried every diet, none of them works, and she's railing about all the the burden of living with obesity in this modern society and even the physicians are constantly trying to tell her to lose weight and it's a heartbreaking book but in it she says look some people are just built fat And that idea that some people are just built fat is as intuitively obvious or should be more intuitively obvious than the idea that we get fat because we eat too much And I've argued this in my previous books, you know, you go outside, you see someone sitting on a park bench who's 400 pounds or 300 pounds, all you know about them is that they have this unfortunate burden of accumulating too much fat. You know nothing about how much they eat and exercise. And yet our conventional thinking is they got fat because they ate too much and didn't exercise enough, and not that they have some kind of dysregulation of fat accumulation. If they were eight feet tall, you'd know they had a secreting too much growth hormone. It's clearly a hormonal problem. If they were eight feet tall and 400 pounds, you would know it's a hormonal problem because they would kind of look built like other people. But if they're six feet tall and 400 pounds, you blame their appetite or maybe their genes that are making them eat too much. And I just had to go after this one more time. I'll have to go after it again. One of the, the next book I'm writing is purely on diabetes and this the overeating hypothesis of obesity is fundamental to how we understand diabetes. And then I want to write a book that's just a history of thinking on obesity and research so people can see how we embrace this idea and why and on the basis of what data, which is virtually none, and how it infected everything that came after. As you've talked about a bit already, there's a growing acceptance in the medical community that low-carb diets can be an effective way to lose weight. But physicians are typically still pretty reluctant to recommend low-carb or ketogenic diets in particular because they say that they don't know much about their long-term safety. So instead, many physicians will stick to the viewpoint that a low-fat, we're going to say Mediterranean diet, and I know we've talked about this before in some talk, we're not quite sure what that means, is the safest and most effective way to eat. Yet in your research, what evidence have you found that a quote-unquote Mediterranean diet is safer and healthier in the long term than a ketogenic diet? And, and well, this is one of the problems with the research in general. In order to answer that question, you would need a clinical trial, a randomized control trial that randomized subjects to a Mediterranean diet or a low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet. And the reason I keep using that long terminology is because I, I still don't know how important it is to be in ketosis. Anyway, you do, you randomize your subjects, you run them out for 5, 10, or 20 years. The more subjects you have, the shorter the follow-up has to be, and you could get a real idea idea of whether or not uh, the Mediterranean diet is safer. Yeah. I have no idea what that even means, though, Gary. Does it mean the Mediterranean is a large, diverse place with, uh, (laughs) you know, people eating uh, lamb and arugula in one place and the next place eating pizza and pasta? You know, it's unclear what that means. it, and it's always been unclear what it means. I actually, I spent a couple of years living in Paris in the mid 80s. And it's funny because the Greek restaurants in Paris, of which there were a lot of them, were the, always the ones that had the beef in the window. You know, of course. All the meat was, and, I, and they were the ones selling shawarma out front, which I still don't know what it is. So I can't tell you, but it was meat, animal product source. But it, it, this conception of a Mediterranean diet is mostly plants and olive oil is... Yeah, it means the, the, they've the never reason, been to the Mediterranean, right? It's a, a lot of lamb, yeah. a lot of beef, well, a lot it of might fish. Have, it, <laughs> right, it might have been what, in fact, the conception comes from what uh, some Mediterranean islanders were, written, were eating in the decade post-World War II, but they had also gone through severe famines yeah. uh, during World War II, so they were not typical Americans. There's so many issues with this. 
And that particular island uh, though, that was studied, th those people had no choice but to eat that. And as soon as they did have choices, they went back to their lamb and uh, and veggies. And, yeah. You know. Well, even uh, at one point, last I looked around five years ago, if you ask somebody what population eats the most cheese per capita, it wasn't the French, it was the Greeks because of their feta consumption. And when they're poor, feta was the main source of protein in their diets. Mm -hmm. So again, you have this, I remember I used the phrase pathological science in discussing why I got into nutrition research. Pathological science is a phrase coined by a Nobel laureate chemist named Irving Langmuir. He used it back in a lecture at IBM in 1957. Um, it means the science of things that aren't so, okay? It's not about fraud or misconduct. It's about all the ways that people can fool themselves into believing something's true that's not. And scientists are prone to this just like all the rest of us are. And there's the implication has always been that there is a lot of pathological, there's a lot of science being generated and produced to get people publications and get them funding and get them into um, uh, academic positions and keep them in academic positions. That's pretty much you know, I think of it almost as noise generation. In nutrition and obesity research, because it's so difficult to actually test your hypotheses, you know, I was discussing the problems with testing the hypothesis that a Mediterranean diet is safer than a ketogenic diet. The researchers have pretty much stopped doing rigorous tests. They're expensive. They usually have to be funded by the NIH um, and planned for years in advance to get them to even have a chance of thinking you're doing it right. So rather than testing their hypotheses, they've just chosen to assume that their hypotheses are probably true because that's what they and most of their colleagues believe. And it's sort of the worst tendencies in science, and it's what uh, rigorous science argues you cannot ever do, because the goal of science, right, is to establish reliable knowledge, not to just assume that what we think is true is. Mm -hmm. So we have problems throughout the nutrition and obesity world. And uh, yeah, the problem with a person like me, a journalist, uh, criticizing this, or even when researchers criticize it, the, the response is to criticize the critics. Right. It's typically ad hominem response. You know, you, yeah. you saw that in your case, and you saw it in Nina's case. Um, well, not only that, even uh, the, the academics oh, yeah, critique for sure. the research. People don't say, you know, that one of my fundamental problems has been with the nurses' health study at Harvard because they, uh, the, researchers involved, Walter Willett and oh, Mayor Stamford and others have, have driven uh, nutrition thinking in this country. They're very, they're considered to be very influential because they're at Harvard. I'm not. And uh, they have this big study that generates associations between disease and, and, and diet, and they assume that the associations are causal. They don't advocate that they be tested. They don't go down to Congress to lobby for funding to test them. They don't insist to their funding agents at the NIH that they should test them. They just say, look, because we've done this, we assume this is true. And there's copious evidence that it's not, but even then, if nothing else, if they were real scientists, they would be lobbying to test their hypotheses. Mm -hmm. That's what scientists do. They test hypotheses. I mean, we can go after it on so many different levels. Right. The initial problem here, though, like I said, is just simple. Just this idea that obesity is caused by overeating. It is everywhere in this field. It influences how we think even about heart disease and uh, cancer and diabetes, and it's naive almost beyond conception. Well, it is, caused, it is caused by overeating, but if by overeating the wrong things, so uh, overeating Well, but overeating is bread. a... It, once you use a phrase like overeating, you're, it means... I know, I'm pulling your leg. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> you, does um, your leg feel it? A <laughs> uh, little bit. Okay. Yeah. You know, we, we're talking about ketogenic diets, and, you know, I actually know a person that consumes an incredibly unhealthy ketogenic diet and has not experienced many of the benefits that so many people do. And uh, I'm exaggerating here, but uh, essentially uh, this person has a diet of uh, Crisco. You remember Crisco? Yeah. Oof. Why? Shortening sort of Crisco and bacon diet. Now, I'm exaggerating, and I tease him, right? But 
Uh, this is the kind of things this guy devours. And um, he somehow from a podcast uh, got the idea that the quality of what he eats doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it, it's sort of as long as it's fat, right? So let me just cut to the chase and say this is not working for him. And it shouldn't uh, okay. be surprising it's not working for him, right? And I understand this is nothing like what you're suggesting. But the reason I bring this up, you, see, you might wonder, why did Ken bring his unusual friend up? Well, the reason I brought him up is this is exactly how many of the critics essentially cartoon the ketogenic diet, right? They sort of have a, a scathing cartoon of it that it's the Crisco and bacon diet or it's the... Um, you know, some Not other the butter and bacon uh, diet, yeah, nothing yeah, else. And, and it's sort of a cartoon. It's a way of dismissing something without real serious discussion. And um, I think that's widespread. I mean, it, you see it particularly in the media, particularly journalists do this. Yeah, it's uh, there are a lot of ways to dismiss it. Um, again, to uh, to address it is to confront some real tension between. Uh, you know, the nutritional wisdom. Right. Uh, one way I discuss it in the book is I say we have sort of two mutually uh, exclusive definitions of the concept of a healthy diet. So the conventional wisdom is a healthy diet is a diet with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, you know, red meat in moderation, no processed meats, fish, and the green vegetables, right? And that's, and we know that's, a, that, so why, why is it healthy? Because we believe if you eat that diet, you'll live as long as possible based on the observational evidence epidemiology, folks like, uh, you know, Walter Willett's group at uh, Harvard with their nurses' health study, because that's what healthy people tend to eat. So one definition is we should all eat the way healthy people tend to eat, and then we should ignore the fact that the reason healthy people tend to eat this way is because that's how they were told to eat 40 years ago when the study started. So the health-conscious people embrace these thinking. And so healthy people tend to be health conscious people. And now we don't know if they're healthy because of how right. they're eating or whether they're health conscious. The alternative definition of a healthy diet is if a doctor tells his patient to give up sugars, starches, and refined grains and beans and legumes too, and live off of, you know, meat, fish, and fowl and green leafy vegetables and eat plenty of fat, they'll get healthy. So one is a hypothesis-driven definition. If you eat this way, we won't necessarily see any change in your health, but we think you'll live longer than you would otherwise. And the other is a, based on clinical observation. If I tell you to give up carbs, abstain from carbohydrates, and replace those calories with fat, not Crisco, but healthy, fat, you know, natural fats from whole foods, you'll get healthier. And I can watch it happen. Your weight will come down, your blood pressure will come down, your blood sugar will come into control, your inflammation will reduce. You know, the physicians report this all the time. They're not, I realize the world of bias is involved with what physicians think they're seeing in their patients. But when you see chronic diseases going into remission, that's a pretty powerful observation, especially if it's reproducible. So in patient after patient, or maybe yourself. So how does the medical research community deal with that? And one way to do it is to cartoon it, you know, go after straw men. But I was reading an article just today in a Insider, Business Insider, I forget which, in which basically they said, look, any diet that recommends you could eat bacon as a snack is an unhealthy diet. And I want to ask the woman involved, how do we know bacon is unhealthy, the reporter? And she's going to respond, well, everybody thinks that way. And then I'm going to say, but how do we know what's unhealthy? Show me the studies. <laughs> and we're going to get nowhere, and she's going to think I'm annoying, and I'm going to continue <laughs> to think she's a bad journalist. But it's sort of, there's a, a lot of con. Once you embrace a paradigm as truth based on such unreliable evidence, it's almost impossible to dislodge it. Gary, we know that there are many degrees of carbohydrate restriction that can be termed low carb, but do you think there's a threshold that people should aim for in order to derive the metabolic benefits of a low carb diet? And then a second question, what's your take on whether a ketogenic diet provides additional benefits over general carbohydrate restriction? And of course, we definitely appreciate that this depends on the context to a substantial extent. Okay, so let me unpack that thinking a little bit here. Uh, 
Let's define what we mean by a diet working. So the conventional wisdom today, which is insane, is that a diet the diet will is the diet that works is a diet you'll maintain. So they don't care if you lose weight or your blood pressure improves, or your blood sugar gets under control. If you're say you're on some kind of diet and you're sustaining that diet, the conventional, the medical establishment today is is happy with you. In fact, the American Diabetes Association takes that one step further. They now recommend their doctors tell their newly diagnosed diabetic patients to continue eating exactly as many carbohydrates as they've always eaten because their patients are going to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. And if the doctors tell them to do it, that way the doctors can have faith the patients are following their advice. And it makes it easier to dose the patient with insulin. You know, you, 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 yeah, that's kind of the logic. You, yeah, it's, as long as they don't change at all, you know how to dose them. Exactly. If you tell them to change and you change their dose and then they don't change, now you're dosing incorrectly. Yeah. But anyway, so you know, what we're arguing, what I'm arguing, is diets work when they, uh, you have some chronic disorder Disorder, intractable disorder that right now is at best being treated with pharmaceutical therapy. So blood pressure is too high or blood sugar is out of control or your weight is out of control. We don't have pharmaceutical therapy that really works for weight anymore. So you want to reverse that. And the fundamental concept in the ketogenic diet, this low carb, high fat approach is that carbohydrates are fattening. So for those of us who fatten easily, a 1950s era diet book terminology that I find too appropriate not to use. For those of us who fatten easily, the carbohydrates are the link to the diet through the hormone insulin, and we could talk about that. So if you don't want to be fat, now you get to more or less rigid abstention from carbohydrates. If you rigidly abstain from carbohydrate-rich foods, you will be in ketosis, and now you're eating a ketogenic diet. If you only not quite so rigidly abstain um, you can cut back on the carbs you eat, you can improve the quality of the carbs, and I would improve, I, I am assuming, improve your metabolic health considerably without being in ketosis. So what level do you go to is a question, and the argument is, well, at what level, how rigidly do you have to abstain from carbs to get the, get the benefits? Mm. If you moderate it and don't have the benefits, then you have to more rigorously abstain. Mm -hmm. I tend to believe uh, the, and again, based also on speaking with 100, interviewing 120 plus physicians who have now embraced this way of thinking, and that perhaps the best way to do it is to start with pretty rigid abstinence so that you know you're doing it right. You know if there are benefits, you will be getting the maximum benefits, and then you could see how healthy you get eating this way. So, you know, if you try to moderate the approach, and then again, 15 years ago, people, the first question people would ask me, can I eat this? Can I eat that? Can I have ice cream once a week? Can I have potatoes? And it's like, yeah, you can. But if you're 70 pounds overweight and you only lose 10 pounds, you won't know if you might have lost 70 had you not moderated your no, approach. Of course. And, and there's a degree yeah. of individual variation. You know, you, you see across and Clearly. Yeah. 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 And if you, if you do lose 70 pounds, uh, first of all, you'll switch from burning carbs for fuel to burning fat for fuel. So you might, you'll lose a lot of your cravings for the foods that you normally think you can't live without now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an effect that was demonstrated in, you know, laboratory rodents 80 years ago and is copiously reported, anecdotally reported that you crave fat, not carbs. Once you your body goes to burning fatty acids for fuel rather than glucose. Mm -hmm. And then you just might find that 70 pound weight loss is worth a uh, life without ice cream or a life without a donut or a life without a bagel. Yeah, you might not even be interested in that bagel. It might You might not be interested. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, so a lot of what we're talking about here, the hormone insulin and the condition known as insulin resistance, which is type 2 diabetes is a disorder of insulin resistance. And on some level, I think obesity is too. If you're insulin resistant, it means your lean tissue is not taking up glucose as it should in response to the insulin you're secreting. So your body's having trouble controlling blood sugar, so it responds by pumping out more insulin, which isn't surprising since the insulin is being secreted in response to your blood sugar level on some level. Mm -hmm. So if blood sugar isn't coming down, you're going to keep pumping out insulin, and then that insulin works to inhibit mobilization of fat from fat cells. And so the insulin is telling your fat cells to store fat and keep the fat stored while we try to 
you know, burn the glucose that's available. While that's happening, while your insulin is elevated, carbo glucose is the fuel that your body runs on. So you makes all the sense in the world that you'll crave carbohydrates because carbohydrates are effectively the only thing your body will burn for fuel. If you keep your insulin low and your body is you switch over to burning fat and you know you become a fat burner is again diet book terminology. It makes perfect sense that you'll start to crave fatty foods. And again, anecdotally this is reported all the time. Yeah. Clinical trials would be worth doing. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Talk. STEM talk. So, Ken, as scientists, you and I and, and other researchers can really get into the weeds about things when we're talking about science. But what I like about Gary is that he can take some complicated topics and concepts about nutrition and biology and reframe them so that everyday people can understand what he's saying. And there's no question we have an obesity and type 2 diabetes crisis in this country, as we've talked about in other STEM talk episodes. And I hope people will check out Gary's book because he offers great insights into what people can do about their weight and their health. I read something the other day, Don, that in 2016, no state in the nation had a prevalence of obesity under 20%. Wow. Actually, only three states had rates below 25%, and it's probably worse now. What is alarming and most tragic about this is that no state in the country had a prevalence of obesity above 10% in 1985. Gary has been working tirelessly for the past 20 years to get nutritionists and physicians to realize that America's dietary guidelines with its low-fat recommendation isn't working. The case for keto is important not only because he shines a spotlight on the problem, but he offers a path forward. So if you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.